And interestingly enough, I had to have my trading account with another brokerage firm secretly. I couldn't trade through Merrill Lynch. And there wasn't anybody else in the office who, who traded their own money. I was the only, unless they were doing it secretly and didn't tell me. I was the only person in the office who, who was actually trading their own money. Who actually traded, period, other than putting on trades for their customers. And oh, another, another part of this is that, is that I also had this, um, I just, I, I, don't, I can't really tell you why I knew this, it's just that I did. I just, it just made sense to me. It, it just never occurred to me that trading was anything other than about psychology. I mean, the first trading book I ever bought was, was actually the very, very first book on trading, the, only, the first book that was devoted uh, uh, specifically to trading psychology, which was Jake Bernstein's Investor's Quotient that came out in 1980. So I was, I was not only Im immersed in the concepts of trading psychology virtually right from the very beginning, I was also keeping very extensive journals. Of, of my thinking process, what was going on, what I was observing from uh, other brokers in the, you know, in the uh, Merrill Lynch office, as well as what I was observing from uh, m interacting with my customers. And I noticed we were all kind of, all kind of, you know, conforming to the same patterns, the same problems. But I just say that because I, I did have, you know, I did have this kind of foundation you know, to understand that, that it was basically psychological in nature. Because one of the things we're going to talk about, you know, when I get into the skill section of, of this, of the presentation, is that when you look at trading skills, it's like, well, what kind of skills are we talking about? If we're talking about thinking like a professional, we're implying that the skills are all mental in nature, and they are. Because when you really get right down to it, and you really start to think about it, what physical skills are necessary to, to trade? We're not talking about a golf swing or a tennis racket or any other kind of, you know, any other kind of physical endeavor that, that, we're, we're, that we're familiar with. What kind of skills we, what does it take physically to put on a trade? The mouse, mouse click, that's it. Your ability to move the mouse and click it on the buy or sell button. It's that simple. And as a result of it being that simple, it's easy to think that, oh my God, trading is so easy. It isn't, as you well probably know, whether you've been at it a long time or even a little bit of time. There are some very sophisticated psychological skills that you have to acquire to get this kind of an equity curve. And, and virtually all these skills are founded in learning how to trade without fear. That's basically what this whole workshop's about, is learning how to trade without fear. Because that's what's going to screw you up on virtually everything. Everything that you can do wrong as a trader is going to be the result of what you're afraid of and the effects that fear has on your perception of market information. So, so with my situation, it's like here I'd given all this up to go to Chicago to learn how to trade, to find out that the only people who really knew how to trade back then were, were people that I didn't have access to. Meaning there were, there were, you know, there were some big names in the industry who never really took the time or expended the effort to find out exactly what it is that allowed them to create a consistently rising equity curve. What they would say is, well, yeah, you got to go with the flow. The trend is your friend. Cut your losses. Let your profits run. You know, there's it was all, these, all these neat little phrases, but it's like, who in the hell knew what that meant and how to do it? Yeah, it sounds great. Cut your losses. Let your profits run. Oh, you know. Even cutting your losses is, can be extremely difficult to learn. Letting your profits run can be 10 times more difficult than learning how to cut your, prof cut, cut your losses. In fact, it's one of the most difficult things to, to acquire in terms of a skill is learning how to let your profits run. So it was like all this was kind of building up and my lifestyle was, was, draining, it was draining my money away. And one of the things, that, one of the things that, that I would say characterized me back then, if I was probably obsessive about anything, it was my credit. 
It's like my credit was my, as far as I was concerned, it was like the most important thing in life is to have flawless, flawless credit, not just, I mean, flawless. And here I'm in a situation where I'm, I am truly running out of money. And my trading losses, I didn't really, it wasn't really like I was losing a lot of money trading because I'd really stopped the hemorrhaging. I wasn't trading in a way where I was actually losing money, but I wasn't making any money. And it's like there was always this little voice in the back of my brain, you know, would come to the forefront of my consciousness and would say, you know, Mark, this ain't adding up. There's something wrong here. There's something, there's something wrong. It's like it's not, it's not adding up. And then I kind of shove it back there and, you know, like, it's going to be all right. I'll figure it out. I'll figure it out. It's going to be all right. Eventually it got to the point where I, I, I was literally out of money. And the only choice I had was to file bankruptcy. Fortunately, I was in a situation where I had two residences, one in Chicago and one in Michigan. And so I had a choice of where I filed. And of course, I filed in Michigan because if Merrill Lynch would have found out, they probably would have fired me. As a matter of fact, nobody knew what had happened. I, nobody knew in Chicago, nobody that I knew in Chicago knew what had happened. So I filed in Michigan and I'm thinking, and literally, because of my attitudes about credit, I'm thinking, if I've got to do this, I'm going to fall beneath the cracks of society and never reemerge. I really believe that. I honestly, God really did. I just didn't see how it was possible to live after having, have to, after having to do something like that. And of course, you know, what I found is that, and when I ended up, I mean, what I say in The Disciplined Trader, and I don't really go into a lot of detail in The Disciplined Trader about this, but just, just to say that what I ended up with was really, I, I had an apartment, I, I had my bed and my TV, and, 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 and when, I, when I filed, I was still current on everything. I wasn't even late one day on any of my bills. As a matter of fact, I even, I even called, you know, called the, the, the finance company to come and pick the car up. But I wasn't even late a payment. I said, you know what, I can't do it anymore. You're probably going to want it back anyway. So, you know, it was like, come and pick it up. And, of course, they did. And uh, what I realized, I mean, now, you think about this. It's like, it's like when you define yourself based on your possessions, you know, just like anybody that loses anything, you, you know, you, you've, got, you've got an internal representation and you've got an external representation. And now there was, there was a, uh, a discrepancy between what was outside of me and what was inside of me in terms of the way that I define myself. And, you know, so that has to be reconciled. And what I realized, you know, and it, it didn't even really take that long. I don't remember how long it took, but it was like, one, I still had my job at Merrill Lynch. And so as a result, I mean, it's like I'm starting thinking, okay, well, things are going to be all right. I was in my worst fear. I mean, that was my worst fear. I mean, when the, when the fear would creep up into the forefront of my mind, I was like, the, you know, that was my worst fear. Now I'm in it. And I'm realizing that, you know, I think I'm going to be all right. I, I'm healthy. I can still think. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to be all right. And when I came to this realization that I'm going to be all right, this is when things change for me as a trader. And, and, this is, and this is the interesting part about my situation that, that most people don't have the benefit of experiencing. There are two things. One, I had this foundation of knowing that it was all psychological anyway. So I had all these things that, I, that I'd been working on up to that point. And two, when you tap out as a trader, I mean, when you really tap out, you don't get to trade anymore because you don't have any money, right? But I was in a situation where I still got to trade. Even though I was working with other people's money, I still got to trade every day. And so as a result of experiencing my worst fears, coming to the realization that I'm going to be all right, and then at the same time being, being in a position where I'm able to interact with the market, it was like because I didn't have anything more to lose, I didn't. It was like, it was like this, the market completely changed for me. It was like I had these blinders on that all of a sudden just came off because the market was different because I wasn't afraid anymore. I was seeing the same patterns over and over and over again beforehand, but I was seeing the same patterns differently. I was seeing the same patterns from a, let's say, relatively carefree state of mind. And that relatively carefree state of mind allowed me to like say flow in and out of my trades with an ease and effortlessness that I would not have been able to imagine beforehand. And then what happened is that I started making consistent money for my customers. There was a like one of these management consultants that came in from New York and she was going around the office 
talking to all the different brokers because of what or whatever, whatever it was that they were trying to find out. And she got to me, and at that, by that time, I was already writing The Discipline Trader. And so, and I just like, you know, I started very exciting to say, oh yeah, this is what I found out, and this is what I've learned. And her eyes lit up saying, this is exactly, this is exactly what we're looking for. And she was just, you know, we talked for probably about an hour, hour and a half, and she, she was all excited. And then she, and then she said, I, you know, I got to go tell, well, I'm not going to say his name, the, the office manager, okay? And she walked away from me, walked over to the office manager. Ten minutes later, ten minutes later, he came over and said, pack up your stuff and get out. Right then and there, right then and there on the spot. Pack up your stuff and get out.